You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy app. So this is going to be part two of our week-long-ish two-part series. None of that really made sense, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Similar to the last episode I just got done doing, this will be sort of a grab bag. That is to say, a whole lot of stuff happened, I'm going to just reach into a bag, pull something out, talk about it, and we'll do that for about 20 to 25 minutes, and we'll call it a day. Uh, Do make sure, because, you know, we're cranking out two a day, just try to make sure you're all caught up on uh, the latest podcasts. It's easy for one or two to get buried in there, so just make sure you're all caught up. But we will take our commercial break, and we will dive straight in. Don't know what straight means, but uh, let's do this. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details so i want to pick up right where i left off actually um the the next two things i want to talk about are Number one, just kind of corralling some things that are getting out of control because a fan favorite is starting to get all hypey and blah, blah, blah. And then also make fun of people who write uh, silly things. Because although I have absolutely nothing against reporters, you know, when they report stuff, I really just don't like it when people just make stuff up and stir up drama for no particular reason, particularly regarding the Green Bay Packers. And I think that kind of happened again, and I'm getting kind of tired of it. But the first thing is about Raven Green. This is very similar to the James Crawford thing, but I think this might have a little bit more hype to it and and probably more legs to it. But there is a certain corner of Packers Twitter and Facebook and whatever that are really big Raven Green fans. Have been for a long time, have stuck in his his corner for a real long time, and now he's out there running with the ones as sort of the box safety, right? The number three guy that comes out in your dime defense as a linebacker and you know some people are kind of taking victory laps like yeah there's my guy dude he got the job by default raven green is just another guy who is an undrafted free agent that looks really good in the preseason some people just cannot let it go similar to kumaro similar to whoever not saying people can't be good in the regular season but we've now seen raven green not be very good in the regular season small sample size but whatever Point is, he's an undrafted free agent, had one really good preseason, could not get on the field even in front of Josh Jones, who the Packers did not really like. He played a total of 45 snaps, 
over three weeks, and only one of those weeks did he play more than 20 snaps. Week 8, he played one snap on special teams. Week 10, he played 31 total snaps. Week 11, he played 13 total snaps. According to PFF, he only had one game in which they graded him as good. In week 11, he was a strong safety. He was given a 28.5 overall grade. It's about as bad as it comes. Now again, small sample size, he might turn out to be, but it's all based on nothing. That's the point I'm trying to get across. If he becomes fantastic, nobody's going to sit back and say, I saw it because you didn't see anything that we haven't seen a thousand times from other players who have a good couple of weeks in preseason. I mean, I, on one hand, I want to just let it go because I want to just let have let fans have fun. But sometimes there's really smart people that just can't just just can't stop. All right, Tim Boyle is a fantastic quarterback, which apparently is a virus that goes around other NFL teams. I've heard other podcasts talking about the there's something about the number three quarterback that every fan base just loses their mind. Reggie Gilbert, basically the greatest pass rusher in the history of the universe. That is until the regular season starts, in which he just can't contribute at all. Jay Kumaro. You know, big play Kumaro every single week, just ripping off big plays. Regular season starts, eh, plays like a free agent. Undrafted free agent, that is. Raven Green is taking that job because Tremont is at corner. Josh Jones didn't show up. Amos and Savage are one and two. And the only other guys on the team are Mike Tyson and Trey Matthews. And the only reason he's getting the first look, and, you know, I'm not saying he isn't going to win the job, but the only reason he's getting the first look is because he's the veteran. He's been there a year. They're not on day one in a system that Raven Green knows and Mike Tyson and Trey Matthews don't going to put in Tyson. No, they're going to put in Raven. Even though he's primarily a free safety, he's the only safety on this team that understands the system. So he's going to go in as the number three. It's by default, and the Packers are not happy about it. If, If the Packers had the ability to snap their fingers with no ramifications whatsoever and change who that person is, they would. And if Josh Jones had showed up, there is no doubt in my mind Josh Jones would be starting over Raven Green. Again, maybe Raven would have taken it from him, I don't know. But just just for all the people out there doing victory laps about Raven Green, I knew it, I knew it. No, we went out and got Adrian Amos because Raven Green isn't the answer. We went out and got Darnell Savage because Raven Green isn't the answer, because Josh Jones isn't the answer, because Tremont isn't the answer. We didn't have the answer on this team, so we went out and paid for him, drafted him, traded up to get him in the first round. Again, not trying to come down hard on him, but let's try to manage our expectations a little bit. Beyond that, there's something bigger I want to talk, and I'm I'm kind of getting tired of doing it. As much as I like just being mean and, and just really, you know, it's a cathartic feeling to just yell into my microphone at people. It feels good, but I'm really trying not to do it because the only, you know, I don't want to call it hate mail, but the only negative comments I've ever gotten is when I get angry so I'm trying to just you know calm down in my old age but it's it's getting a little tiresome so it all kind of and the funny thing is it it starts outside of of you know the inner circle of Packers people there's chatter started with the Aaron Rodgers chatter that there was a dysfunction and then you get some inside guy who's no longer on the inside whatever his name is I forget he goes gets a bunch of anonymous sources drops this garbage article out there it was all but proven to be just trash but now it's just lingering well from there there's this thing about how and and i don't know where it came from and i don't know if i ever commented on it but i think it's all garbage the idea that the structure of the packers organization is terrible i don't think anybody is correct about that now maybe this isn't ideal but again to be clear i think the situation was essentially this you had mark murphy with his back to the organization looking outward he was working on Title Town. He was working on everything else. And the team just kept nosediving. He turns around and he sees a bunch of coaches not trying, a locker room in disrepair, a, a GM that hasn't drafted a good football player in about three years, with the exception maybe of, of I guess, Kenny Clark was his one hit over the last two to three years. Stale offense, stale defense, just, you know. So he turns around and he says, enough is enough. Now, again, I understand the GM stepped down, but I'm telling you right now, if he wouldn't have stepped down, he would have been replaced. The head coach was given a one-year extension. In other words, you get one year to prove your worth, and everybody under him was cut out from underneath him. Defensive coordinator, goodbye. Mark Murphy set this whole thing in action. All the Packer fans and everybody else is trashing Mark Murphy. The reason we have Gutekunst and Lafleur is because Mark Murphy turned around and said enough is enough. 
And and Brian Gutekunst is following that same no-nonsense path. And the head coach tried his best. It wasn't working. And he got fired. And he got replaced. And we saw with the roster, with Brian Gutekunst, with that same mentality. You will perform, you will fall in line, or you will be off this team. I think that's the right thing to do. And, I, I, you know, again, I don't know if this is an ideal structure, but I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with it. And I don't think I've heard anyone even illustrate why this is a bad structure. There's all this negativity about Murphy. I don't get it. Oh, he talks too much in the... I, what? I loved that press conference when Lafleur was, was hired because I've been wanting to know what's going on, and he gave us a peek behind the curtain of the whole process. I thought it was great. Everyone starts crying. Well, I want to just hear the coach talk. Well, whatever. It's like people just want to dislike Mark Murphy. I don't understand it. So now there's this thing about, oh, he's a power-hungry... Gr-. No, he's been an absentee owner. Not really an owner, but absentee CEO. He turned around, found out the place was in disrepair, overhauled the whole thing, put in Gutekunst, helped hire Lafleur, and I think things are on a good path. We'll, we'll we'll have to see how things go with the draft. We've only had one. It's you know we we don't exactly know how it went. We've had a second one now. I clearly don't know how that went. No idea how the head coach is going to turn out. But the overturning of the the team needed to happen immediately, and it did. And that's all thanks to president and CEO, Mark Murphy. But somehow, somewhere, there started, you know, bubbling up this talk about it. And essentially, it's not even necessarily wrong. You've had certain people say, we've seen this structure before and it didn't work. That's fine. Lots of times things have happened before that don't work, but then work. We've seen coaches that are not successful that go on to be successful. We've seen people try to create gadgets and gizmos that don't pan out and then all of a sudden they do. Maybe there's a different reason that structure didn't work. Maybe Mark Murphy knows better and is going to run this better. What specifically is bad about this, nobody can really say. It's just unorthodox. Apparently some people have seen people try it and it hadn't worked in the past. Well, because this is becoming a national thing and it's becoming popular, good, experienced writers realize this is a good opportunity to make some money. So Tom Silverstein, who I like, I mean, he's about as dry as you get on his podcast, but I like his podcast. I don't even know if he has it anymore. But I liked listening to it. It's informative and whatnot. He realized that this is a cash-in moment. This is a nat. And anytime something about the Packers is national, you're going to want to get some information. So he goes out and somehow decides that the way he's going to cash in on this is to see who really, you know, is is carrying water here. Because the narrative is they've got this overarching, you know, power-hungry president and CEO Mark Murphy who's making all the calls. I mean, he's he's sort of like. Uh, Vladimir Putin, you know, he's, he's the one, he's, he's, he says other people are in control of this, that, or the other. Now, he, he runs the whole show. Everybody else is just a puppet, including the elections themselves. It's all a big facade. He runs and controls everything. So how does he do this? Well, according to the Green Bay Packers, Lafleur had control over his coaching staff. He goes out, talks to some sources. The sources say that's not true. He writes a big article about it. Here is a paragraph just to kind of give you an idea of the feel of how this whole thing is supposed to sound. It's from Pro Football Talk, the NBC thing or whatever. I think this kind of sums up everything. But it says, that detail, it's, you know, whatever, comes in a long story that is heavy in anonymous sources, short indirect quotes, but paints a picture of the burgeoning dysfunction in the Packers front office, where Lafleur, Brian Gutekunst, and uh, Russ Ball are all vying for authority. I don't know if people are just caught up in Game of Thrones and everybody just wants to nerd out on stuff. I think this is dumb because it comes from nowhere. This is made up. There's no information that says that Brian, Matt LaFleur, Brian Gutekunst, and Russ Ball are fighting for power. All underneath this, this overarching, powerful you know, president and CEO. Goes on to say, the story hints at several issues in Green Bay, but the issue with assistant coaches is particularly noteworthy. Because sources contradict the claim from Murphy Murphy, that Matt was allowed to make his own decisions. Here's the the first claim, which is just silly to me. I mean, it it, it, it doesn't even take brain power. I just read it and said, that doesn't even make sense. Here's the next paragraph. Instead, LaFleur reportedly tried to get Darren Rizzi as his special teams coach, but was unable to land him because the Packers lowballed him on a contract. So what? That's not a contradiction. At, at, at what point did, did Mark Murphy ever say, we're going to write a blank te- check for any coach he wants in the league? If he wants Bill Belichick to be our linebackers coach, we'll write him a check for a billion dollars. What are we even talking about? 
I'm, I'm sure Lafleur wasn't the only one. I'm sure Russ Ball wanted Darren Rizzi. I'm sure Mark Murphy did. I'm sure everybody wanted him because he's a very good coach. That doesn't mean you don't have a budget you have to stick to. There's still a power structure in place. He's not king. He's not judge, jury, and executioner. He just gets to say who he wants. And and it even goes on further because apparently they made him an offer, meaning he did have a say. He said, I want that guy. So then he turned it over to the people in charge or who make these decisions. They reached out for a negotiation, and the negotiation fell through. They offered him what they were able to offer a special teams coordinator. Darren said, no, that's the end of the story. So instead they hired Sean Menenga. So what? Where's the contradiction? Where's the scandal? Where's the lie? Well, the floor wanted a guy. They went out and tried to get him. They couldn't get him. So then they went out and got their second choice. The other claim that was made is that they strongly suggested that he keep the same defensive coordinator, Mike Pettin. Again, so what? The fact that it was even phrased as they strongly suggested... What does a suggestion mean to you, genius? It means LaFleur had the power to fire the defensive coordinator if he so chose. But I think it's a great relationship. I think it makes sense. I think the Packers wanted to keep him for all the right reasons. And because they're so overwhelmingly, it it makes so much sense to keep him. You know, the guys are going into their second year. It's going to be very bad for your team if you have a new defensive coordinator. Because they're all going to have to learn a new system. That's not great for you because you are strictly an offensive guy. You offer no help to the defense. So trying to install a brand new offense and a new defense and and all the other stuff that he said positive. He used to be a head coach. He's leaning on all that stuff. The Packers said, we think it would make sense and we would like to keep um, Mike Pettin. Here are the reasons. LaFleur said, I agree. End of conversation. I I don't see anywhere in here. Because again, the claim is LaFleur wasn't the sole decision maker. Show me one decision that was made that was not Matt LaFleur's. There is a suggestion, and then there was a negotiation that fell through. A negotiation that was initiated by the head coach who said, I want that guy. And the Packers tried to go out and get that guy. So what are we even talking about? You know, you add all this up. You know, the the anonymous sources and all the same stuff. And I, I get it. I understand anonymous sources, but you have to understand as a writer from our perspective, it means nothing to me. Well, I got to keep them anonymous. Okay, well, then I don't have to take you seriously. You have your prerogatives and, so, and, and I have mine. This is garbage. I have the, the head coach. I have the president himself. I, I have all the people that you're talking about giving me the answers I need, but I'm supposed to listen to you, Tom Silverstein, and your make-believe sources over in the corner? Not that I think they're actually make-believe, but it's just, it's just silly. But Murphy went on to um, address this in the, uh, the, the Murphy mailbag thing or whatever, and he, here's what he had to say. Coach LaFleur had complete control over the hiring of his coaching staff. The report was the result of an article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel based on interviews with 20 anonymous sources. I told the author that Coach LaFleur had complete control to hire his assistants, but he included comments to the contrary from anonymous sources. The editor said they wanted to present a balanced view. Which doesn't even make sense. What, what does that even mean, a balanced view? Of what? Th- this is a true, th- this is a pass-fail. This is a true-false situation. Y- you don't balance it. That's like you coming to me and saying, what's two plus two? And I say four. And you write an article saying, well, somebody told me it's six. And I say, what, do, what are you doing? It's four. Well, we just want some balance. It's not a balance. You're wrong. Stop writing that. Stop telling people that. It's not six. It's four. You're dumb. What balance? How is this balanced? You've unbalanced it. It was balanced when I said it correctly, and you've unbalanced it. He goes on to say this, which is also very telling. If you wanted information about whether or not Coach LaFleur had control over his hiring of, of his assistants, who would you ask first? Maybe Matt LaFleur? That's not what Mark Murphy said. That's what I said. But here, here is what he goes on to say. Interestingly, they never asked Coach LaFleur if he was able to hire the assist- his assistants, something he would have confirmed. Again, there's no drama here. This is all entirely made up. The idea that there's a power struggle is made up from the outside, from people that don't know. The idea that Murphy's this overbearing whatever, made up. The tension between this person and that person, made up. And now the idea that Lafleur did not have control over the hiring is also made up. We know that because everybody that actually knows 
has said that this is the case. And then you have people going outside of that, trying to make a case that it's not true. Why? Simply to, to drum up drama. He finishes it up by saying, hiring assistant coaches is one of the most important factors in the success of a head coach, and I've always felt it foolish to restrict them in any way. Making a suggestion is not limiting them or saying they cannot do something. It's a suggestion. Having a budget and, and not writing blank checks is different than, than taking control. Again, Matt LaFleur wanted a special teams coach. The Packers promptly went out to go get him. Show me the drama. Show me the lie. You can't because it doesn't exist. They didn't make him Lord of the Universe. He can't force magical money to come out of nowhere to hire whoever they want for whatever price they want, and he can't make people accept jobs that they're not willing to take. He said, I want that coach. The Packers went out and got him, and it was the special teams coach, Rizzi, that said, no. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, but I don't. I also don't care. But but do you get what I'm saying? This is silly, man. And it's, it's upsetting seeing it from Tom Silver's time because I like him. I think he's got a wealth of knowledge. He's been doing this kind of stuff longer than I've been alive. His ability to look at things in, in a certain way is, is well beyond. I mean, I, I that's what I aspire to be. In 20 years, I want to be doing this podcast, and I want to be able to look at a situation and draw on 20 years of experience and just be able to say, well, you know, back in... Back in 2018, boy, oh boy, back in my day, I don't know why I would have a southern accent. I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll move down south. Also, in 20 years, I'll be 50, not 90, so I don't know why I sound like an old man. But it doesn't matter. He's in a really good position of, of being a respected person with a wealth of knowledge, and he just cheapened his entire career with this nonsense. Tyler Dunn is the guy's name. I, I really think he did a disservice because you look at how big that got. He was all over national media. He's made probably tons of money and all this stuff. And if this is your job, if this is your life, you you live for that. I want that experience. Not me personally. I don't want that experience ever. Parading as a, around as the guy that just smacked, uh, you know, people that I've looked in the eye and shaken their hand and, and, you know, whatever. I'm not getting back into Tyler Dunn. But the point is this whole thing is nonsense. It doesn't mean anything. It's all garbage. We have a head coach. His job is to be the head coach, primarily running a new offense and getting these guys up to speed. Once he gets them up to speed, his job is going to be to call plays and make sure that he calls the right plays at the right time with the right guys on the field. We have a GM. The GM's job is not to usurp power because this is not wizardry hour. This is not Game of Thrones. This is not Dungeons and Dragons. This is not the nerd power hour. These are professional individuals who have jobs with the very good paying jobs. First time head coach is trying to be a head coach. The first time GM is trying to be a GM, and Russ Ball is off making a lot of money being Russ Ball, managing money and whatnot. Mark Murphy, I, I would assume, would love to go back to being old Mark Murphy, but now he's playing babysitter to make sure people don't end up being dumb. And who knows, give it a little time, maybe he'll relinquish a little bit of power once he realizes that these guys can act like adults and actually do their job and not get lazy and complacent. But for now, he's going to be the babysitter. And he's going to overlook everything. And he's going to have meetings with people to make sure that everybody's doing the job that they need to do because he's the president and CEO and needs to make sure that the Green Bay Packers can get back on top. And until they get there, it's his responsibility to make sure that this works. And until people can take the reins and make sure that this works, he is going to do his job. He is doing his job. And again, the anti-Mark Murphy stuff is nonsense. All of this is nonsense. None of this has had anything to do with the 2019 NFL season. Nothing Mark Murphy is doing right now is going to cause Rashawn Gary to have a, a terrible season. None of this is going to cause Aaron Rodgers to throw interceptions. None of this is going to cause injuries. All the things that are going to add up to either having a really good or really terrible season have nothing to do with this made-up nonsense. And if I may, even if it was entirely true and this is what you uncovered... What a really lame thing that you just just uncovered. Like, what, what, what does that mean? First year head coach doesn't have 100% of the power. He only gets, what, 83%? Ooh, easy, Tom. You're really going at the knees there. Take it easy, big guy. Whoa. What a waste of... It's a waste of everybody's time. And no, I don't think me talking about it is a waste of time because I need to make sure that we have the proper perspective. And that is to one time and one time only look at this and say, this is dumb. All the issues that are going on, these fake issues and the, the thing that him not having power struggle, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Moving on. And all the Tyler Dunns and the Tom Silversteins 
and all the rest of them can write all these clickbaity articles and try to get national attention, and that's fine. Do whatever you can for your career. I'm sure the thousands of people that listen to me make fun of you doesn't even come close to the, um, the magnitude of the millions of people that see it firsthand, but I'm doing my part to make sure that everyone sees how dumb you are. And, and, and I don't want to do this. I don't want to have to have this job. But I will do my da- job diligently. I promise you that. Stop saying dumb things. Anyways, hopefully by tomorrow we can start getting excited about stuff. I actually just recently realized, as weird as this sounds, we're going to watch this team kind of soon. Like, two months soon. Like, watching them play football. And, and it, it, it's weird because it, it's, maybe it's just because I'm so immersed in all these little things and it all just feels like theory. It, it's, it's crazy. Not just because it's real, but, I mean, it, it's a completely new team. Like, the, the new scheme, the new head coach, we're going to watch that soon. We're going to see this happen. We're going to see the outside zone with Aaron Jones. We're, we're going to see Billy Turner. We're likely going to see Elton Jenkins. I know apparently I'm in the minority on that, and a lot of people think Lane Taylor's the man, and maybe, I don't know. We're going to see a defense with Zadarius Smith, Preston Smith, and Rashawn Gary. We're going to, that's going to happen. I'm hoping I'm blowing somebody's mind out there because it blew my mind when this dawned on me like two days ago. Adrian Amos and and Darnell Savage as our safeties. That will be our defense. We will see this defense soon. Like, this isn't a joke. This isn't like a a fantasy football that we all just made up. And actually, it's Clay and and it's it's Nick Perry and it's uh, Mike McCarthy and it's it's all the same guy. No, this brand spanking new defense with upgrades everywhere not even including the second-year jumps. It's going down. It's going to happen. Beyond excited to watch this. Anyways, uh, I fo- hope I hope you hoax, or hope you folks, whatever. Got to be careful doing that. That was scary. Hope you folks have a fantastic day. I will be here once again tomorrow. Have a great day. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.